Kyle, and he has graciously uh, agreed to be our speaker today, so we'll get started. Well, hi, everyone. Uh, I know some of you, some of you I don't, so I'll give you the quick uh, background. I've been doing marketing for the last 15 years. Uh, about half of that has been in nonprofit. I spent two years as period director for United Way of Central Oklahoma, uh, board member, committee member, and uh, board member a uh, nonprofit that's actually right next door, office next door, uh, Inclusion in Art. Uh, I think Nathan, our executive director, will be through with here in a few minutes. Uh, if anyone wants to talk about actually founding a 501c3, because I kind of work. Communication, uh, it's all about you connecting with the folks you need to connect with in the right way with the right message. Whether it's nonprofit or corporate, uh, that's the core of it. So that'll be the core of our discussion today. I mentioned what we do at the Golden Group. We, we go into organizations, corporate and nonprofit, and we challenge every single thing they do. Even if we like what they're doing, we challenge them and we make them justify what they're doing. Hopefully, you'll be able to take a little bit of that tool set back to your organization, and every time someone says, let's do this, specifically when it comes to marketing, because of course marketing often means money, you can challenge the notion with good set of questions and a good set of parameters so that you can either say, it meets the challenge, we definitely should do that and spend our funding and spend our efforts or do these things, or you don't meet the challenge and now you're just kind of randomly trying to do things which doesn't help your organization. Which leads me to the first question I was asked in social media this week when I said I was gonna do this presentation, which is how do you make impact with a really, really, really small budget? My first bit of information is gonna sound counterintuitive, but it'll make sense in a minute. If you, yourself, or someone else in your organization is in a high-level creative, consult the high-level creative, including paying for one. I know you're gonna say, wait a minute, you just said the budget's small. Often, paying a professional to give you some direction and give you that idea or that thing you couldn't pull off yourself will save you so much time and money in the long run that it's very beneficial, especially for small budget projects. The flip side to that, remember how I say challenge everything, right? Don't let someone who says, hey, I'm really good at Word, and I would love to be a graphic designer. <laughs> I'm gonna be your high level creative on the, on the board. No, thank you for being a board member or a volunteer. Thank you for trying. That's the person who's gonna end up costing you more money on a project. Go back to what it is you're trying to achieve, who your audience is and what your message is, and how they want to be communicated with. Don't make a brochure if your audience is all online. Don't get crazy about your website if your audience is all over 65 or not online. Don't make it a printed piece that has every bit of information about your organization ever if a paragraph about what you do and how it impacts the community will create the actions that you want. Do with them, etc. If it's not serving your core value and creating an action you wish from the audience you wish it to, it's not effective for you and that's just a waste of your time and money. That's the hardest one to get across to people. People say, well, we should just have something to give to people. Something to give to people is crap. It's nothing. It's not effective. It's have to understand who your audience is, what you're trying to elicit from them. Are they going to volunteer? Are they going to donate? Are they going to communicate to other people about your message? Are they going to bring supplies? Are they going to do something? What's the action that you wish them to do? Who they are? What motivates them? Is it pride? Is it uh, empathy? Is it a personal connection to something in their past? What's the thing that most likely motivates your donor, your volunteer, your participant? That's the only message that matters. And if your budget is small, the only focus you can have is on the, on the message that matters most to the person most likely to do the thing you want them to do. So when you do get that high-level, creative, professional marketing, professional communication professional on your board, you go, oh man, we got this guy, this girl, we're gonna rock now, right? They can't just come in and do marketing for your nonprofit the way they do it on their job out of business. There are core principles that translate. But if they work at Devon or Chesapeake or a local chain of grocery stores or they work for a restaurant or they freelance with a variety of clients, 
You can't take their for-profit mindset and put it on your nonprofit. <coughs> it doesn't work. There are great principles they can bring across, but you can't do the same thing the same. Here's the difference. For-profit companies, there's two ways to do marketing. There's the right way, which is really highly effective and beautiful and awesome. Apple and Google and some people like that. Then there's average to terrible way, which we'll discuss in a second, which is everyone else. Then there's a nonprofit way of doing marketing. Nonprofit marketing should look like the highest level of corporate marketing because the highest level of corporate marketing is affecting your emotions and not affecting benefits and sell stuff. The third thing they do in, in terrible corporate marketing is try to sell you features and benefits. This used car has four tires, has cold air, has a V8, only has 80,000 miles, it's one owner, etc., etc., etc. That's terrible, lazy corporate marketing. It's features and benefits, it's listing things and, and hoping that you say, I need a car with four tires. Of course you need a car with four tires. Of course you want air conditioning in Oklahoma, right? Okay. Great brand marketing, corporate marketing, high level marketing, like Apple, like Google, they convey an emotion. They let you understand what happens to you when you use their product. Maybe a great example is during Christmas time, Apple had the, the commercial where the kid made a video of the family on his phone. It looked like he was just on his phone the whole time. He was shooting video, was editing it, and then he showed it on the TV from his phone. And it was like, oh, it's a beautiful commercial, or a beautiful video of our family. How awesome is this, right? They never once said, you can edit from your phone. They didn't talk about how great their camera is. You, as the viewer, followed along as to your emotional reaction to using their product. That's beautiful corporate marketing. That's how beautiful, well-done, nonprofit marketing should be done. Your communication should be listing an emotional response to the person. How does it, what does it do for me? That's the message that if you can communicate it, whether it's video, whether it's print, whether it's social media, it's how you get someone to interact with your nonprofit in a proper and correct way. It's not about features and benefits. Point the focus always has to be communicating your message to your core audience in the way they want to receive it. And for nonprofit, it means it's an emotional response. Now again, as marketing professionals, we hit over the head, over the head, over the head with call to action. Everything's got to have a call to action. Call to action, call to action. Everything has to have a call to action. No, it doesn't. It's a load of crap that everything has to have a call to action. In the nonprofit world, even more so, as much as you would say, so wait, I want people to donate, I want people to volunteer, I want people to spread the word about what I'm doing. That's fine, you can't hit them over the head with the call to action. You have to list up their emotions and they will decide themselves to do it. If someone decides, I'm gonna write you a check, I'm gonna tell people about what your organization's doing, I'm gonna come volunteer for you, that action that they create in their heart and in their mind is more powerful than any call to action on an ad or video ever. That always has to be your goal. Put the focus on your goal. Core value. You are a nonprofit organization. You have written down and discussed and combed over, hopefully, and completely absorbed core value. You know who you are and why you are important in the community. You have to stick to those core values. Sometimes programming gets a little bit in the some gray area. But it's on core, but it's also doing this. Well, there's a little bit of that. If you get too far off your core, you get into chasing audience and chasing dollars. That's one of the hardest things to do when you go challenge the folks in your organization about, we want to do an event, but it doesn't fit our core. But it'll be great. People will love it. We'll have food trucks out, right? <laughs> cool. How does it help our organization? How does it bring the right people in the right door who understand what we do and support us in the right way? If they can't justify it, you have to say no. If you get to not do the things that are being least effective for your organization and just do the things that are highly effective, highly focused, on core, with a message that connects to the people most likely to connect to you, even with a small budget, you're going to be effective and you're not going to be wasting any 
single dollar or time or effort on anything else, or even favors. Sometimes getting a, a brochure printed from a printer who's your friend who's doing it for free, well, you're only going to get a couple of those a year, right? <laughs> you're not going to get something done by your friend at the print shop over and over and over again. Your graphic design friend's only going to do so many things for you on the side. Your web developer friend's <laughs> only going to work on your website so much. Make sure it's highly effective. We have to make sure that effectiveness goes right back to your core now. If not, don't waste the paper. Because at some point, you have to pay for that next brochure, and that goes back to your budget. Second question that was asked online this week was, how to gain media interest for your nonprofit? PR, public relations, is, is what the core of getting coverage in media is. Looks easy on the outside. It's hard and takes a long time and never really ends. You have to build relationships with media outlets over and over and over and keep working at it over and over and over and continue to, and the relationship can't be one way. It can't be you just pushing information at them. It can't be just press releases all the time. It also can't be a press release every daggum week. <laughs> Too much, right? When my PR, when my press releases get picked up, trust me, my social media machine goes full blast on celebrating the fact that the general director of the Daily Call and the Gazette or whoever else put our press release out in the world. I want them to say, doing business with them puts us in connection with other audiences who weren't previously. It's very choreographed, very planned out, but it's how you have to do in order to get real PR on a regular basis. There's no easy way of doing it. There's no shortcut. The approach to PR always has to be there are people that are interested in things, they want to do things, they actually want to help you. But they also have a boss, and a boss's boss, and a boss's boss's boss, and auditors who read the paper. Stop doing that eventually, too. So, have to create relationships, make it a give and take, do things that you can invite them to your event, invite them to even your small event. Trying to put people on your boards and committees who work in media outlets. They don't have to be the president. They don't have to be even a journalist. But someone in an organization could say, hey, the inside scoop really is we don't need anything. Or so-and-so doesn't really write for that, but so-and-so does. Those type of communication uh, relationships uh, will get you much further with PR than just sending press releases all the time. That will get you more. Learn AP file, find someone who can help you with it, create a template for your, for your press release. The first time you get a press release published, especially major publications, you get a major AP publication print from your press releases, that's a golden template. That's the one you use every time. And by template, what I mean is your introductory uh, paragraph, the meat of, the, of, the, of it, and then of course your boilerplate. How you lay it out, how you break it up, the closer to AP style it is, the more likely it will be copied and pasted. Once you find that format that works for a publication, especially for a nationally recognized publication, now you know you're speaking journalist talk. Now you know that they can read through it, they get it the way they would write the story, and they're more likely to connect to it. Once they connect to it, then they're more willing to go to bat with the writer there and say, I want to run this. The beauty of online communications, emails, and, and on anything that's online is you do get to provide a thousand bits of information to mail someone, right? Uh, the downside is if there's too much there, it becomes this blob of blah, what is all this, right? Uh, traditionally what we do is we literally send the press release in a PDF as an officially formatted press release on letterhead, the same exact text in the same format, including in you know all the all the uh, editor marks mm -hmm. in the body of the email with links below that. Okay. If they work all the way down to your last paragraph of your email, they are interested. They want to know more. I wouldn't do more than a couple of links. If you have something that's a massive story, you have video, you have photos, you have uh, all the stuff you've written on it, a whole history of it. I put it on one page in my website. Send one link. Also, if you do have video, if you do have photography, if you do have other um, components of a news story, and photography, not cell phone pictures, 
<laughs> photography, high resolution, 300 DPI photography. If you have it, if you have quality, professional quality, it doesn't have to be professional shot, but professional quality video, you're not cell phone video, unless it's a very unique story, but if you have quality photos and videos of your performances, past or, or the current one you're promoting, um, those elements go a long way to it's getting you in print. If they can supplement the written word with photography, video, web links, etc. cetera. Uh, second half of that, and then what I was telling you about photos and video, the easier you make it for them to do business with you, whether it's publishing your, your, your press release or covering you or doing a feature, how easy you make that process, because you're prepared, because you're on time, because you return phone calls, because you provide information, because you're organized, because you are running your nonprofit as a professional, not a couple of people just trying to do something, more likely someone wants to engage you. More likely, even as a volunteer, you have to act like a professional when you're doing these type of communications for your organization. Always have to think like a professional, because the people you're dealing with are professionals. It's their job. So make their job as easy as you would if you were doing this with something that you were paying for. In an in a overall general sense, I try to tell all my nonprofit clients that negativity is a hard road to go down. That positive stories always trump negative stories. Uh, the question is, what does your organization do to prevent change, move towards the positive? Does that make sense for everyone else? Does that fit anyone else's scenario? First rule, simplicity is key, right? Uh, second rule, always for nonprofits, is the core message. The core message, the core values, your position statement. Our organization does this. The core values and the, and the position statement tells us what we should and should not do. And it makes it easy for you as a board member to argue to not do those things that take you off mission. The worst thing a marketer, communication professional can ever say in their entire career, and normally I would say I would slap them, our products are services for everyone. <laughs> Don't spend any effort trying to get everything. Start at your core. Start at the people most likely to support what you're doing. Whether it's donation volunteer, sign up as a member, whatever it is. Good point that that is. You don't write for yourselves, you don't write for your internal audience, you don't write for the person who has no idea who you are. Um, and you only have, it's elevator speech, right? You only have so many seconds to get a hold of them, to communicate a message. Can't do it in three sentences, we're not going to do it. Most likely it's going to back you. We're not trying to reach everybody. Because anytime you say we're, we're marketing to everybody, you're failing miserably. Social services obviously are valuable too. Homeless, pets, elderly, uh, health. All these things go into what makes our city a great city, solid city, healthy city. And without nonprofit organizations, volunteer organizations doing this type of work, our city can have low taxes and great oil revenue and big employers, but you still don't have a high quality life. So we all, in some way, are playing our role in increasing the quality of life in Oklahoma. You have impact on what's making Oklahoma City the greatest place on the planet right now, right? <laughs> we all play that role as members, board members, employees, etc., cetera, nonprofit organizations. And so it's our part of our job to not only gain support for our organization as a form of check and volunteers, but in our role in contributing to the quality of life of the city. It also makes it easier too for people to say, why should I give your someone else, right? Like, here's our impact. Here's what we're doing, here's how we're making things better in our great city and state. So that has to be part of your, your DNA conversation. Traditional arts organizations, they attract a larger audience, an um, um, older audience. How do you attract a younger audience, right? Without alienating your older audience, right? Well, your older audience wants to see the type of shows, the type of theater, the type of music performance, the type of ballet. Your younger audience is interested in interaction, in side activity, and in entertainment, being entertained. So, phone parties, special favors, discounts on tickets, social interaction, being part of the club is how young people are attracted to traditional arts organizations. You can flip that too. And if you're, um, businesses tie themselves to nonprofits for a couple of reasons. Number one, it's good PR. Number two, it's good morale and it's good for co corporate culture. 
Coca-Cola has become, in the last five years, one of the biggest growth industries as far as people like what I do, and people are thinking something good. You can have a giant building over here, but if your corporate culture sucks, people don't want to come to work. Their product productivity goes down. Coming to work and being happy and being productive, not just meals in the cafeteria and a nice desk and my supervisor is nice and I get a chance to get a raise. These are all great things, but people, especially people under 30, want to work for companies that are philanthropic, that are invested in the community and are doing good things, not just making coffee. Doesn't mean people over 30 don't care about those things, but people under 30 very much focus on that. People under 30 will take less money to work for a company that is socially responsible. So that opportunity for all of us to be a way that the CEO and, and corporate C-suite can show their employees how they're invested in the community is by participating with us, whether it's economically volunteers, uh, providing space, providing services, etc. So when you say when we say funding, all the time we always think about funding is writing checks. Funding is support. Support is checks, it's volunteer hours, it's laying people off work to come volunteer for you. It's providing you the extra office materials, it's providing you old desks and old chairs. Anything that a company can do to support the organization, make your organization stronger and healthier, is good. And then they get to tell their employees in their internal newsletter about how they just made a donation, they had a volunteer day, we did the cleanup day, we did the walk. So 20 of our people ran in the Memorial Marathon. These are things that internally large employers like to talk to with their employees so that their employees feel good about their corporate culture and like coming to work every day. Questions for Kyle? No? Okay. Yeah, thank you so much.